we are talking about heat in reactions and how heat is involved. And it's some reactions are going to take heat in order to even react. If you don't have provide some heat, it's not going to happen. Uh, other reactions, they happen and they can provide a lot of heat. They're going to kick out a lot of heat. Well, we're not supposed to use the word heat, though, Connor. We're supposed to use the word what? Not energy. It's up here. Not the word heat. It starts with an E. Enthalpy. Yeah, we're supposed to use the word enthalpy. Uh, enthalpy is involved in reactions. So that's just the chemist word for heat, actually heat transfer under constant pressure conditions. But OK, so that's where we're at. And there's going to be some homework that talks about getting the kinetic energy of a single molecule. And I'll give you the equation, but we need to know what the units are. Now, today is the old man's birthday. So some of the, the best food known to man, if you get this right, Ashley, what are the units for energy? Right? What are the units for energy? If we're going to use this equation, the standard metric unit for energy. Do you know what it is? Anybody? Joules. Woo -hoo. Joules. Capital J. OK. So how do you get joules? Now remember, kinetic energy is the energy of motion, right? that molecule's moving around. If it's not moving, well, then it won't have any kinetic energy. So Giselle, what's V mean? It's velocity. It's actually speed, right? And it's the speed squared. So if we're going to use that equation, Rebecca, what units should we have speed in? Because if it's not in the right units, you're not going to get joules. What units should speed be in? Yeah, in that equation. You've got to plug it in. It has to be in the right units. Anybody help her out? Nah, you're close. She said meters per second squared. Just meters per second, right? It can't be miles per hour, because that won't give you joules. It has to be in meters per second. Then you've got to square it. So they, if you're going to calculate the kinetic energy of a molecule, they have to tell you its speed, right? But then you also have to plug in little m, Bowdy. What would little m be? Mass of what? Of the particle, mass of the molecule. You want to calculate kinetic energy of a car, you got to plug in the mass of the car. If it's kinetic energy of a molecule, you got to plug in the, right, the mass of the molecule. Okay. Now, the trick, though, I think, to doing this, I give you the equation stuff, so it's not that big a deal. What units does M have to be in? That's why I don't tell you what the units got to be for all this stuff. Now, think metric system. Standard metric unit for mass. Mm, not grams. Not pounds is metric. Actually, actually, for the English system, it's a slug. The metric system, it's not grams. It's what? Kilograms. See if you sit in front. Look at that. I can hear you. Kilograms. OK. So to me, I think that's one trick in doing the, in getting the kinetic energy of a molecule. Know what the units are for everything. Then there's only one thing left that you got to do, Emily, and that's calculate, because they're going to say an oxygen molecule traveling at 400 meters per second, whatever. But you got to calculate the mass of a single oxygen molecule and put it in there. How do you do that? How do you get the mass of a single molecule of anything? What do we do? Not mole bridge. OK, we use molar mass. What did you do with molar mass, though? OK. Avogadro's number. We're so close. Did you say it? Divide, Divide what by what? The molar mass by the there you go. Divide molecular weight, or molar mass, 
by Avogadro's number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And then you got to put it in what? Because you divide those two, what, what are your units? Not moles. If you divide those two, you're not in kilograms, you're in grams. So then you got to convert to kilograms, right? So get it into kilograms and then plug it in. Get it in kilograms, though. And then you plug it in for m. So that's the, how you get the mass of a single molecule of anything. Just divide molar mass by the Avogadro's number. OK, so you will see that in the homework. And, the, and why? Because that's all temperature and heat is. It just makes things move faster, right? So that's why it's there. Transition states and activation energy movie. Let's see what this is. Let's analyze the changes that occur in energy and atomic arrangements as the reaction between nitric oxide and ozone occurs. Initially, the nitric oxide and ozone molecules are separated and are not reacting. The forward reaction proceeding from reactants to products is exothermic by 199.8 kilojoules per mole. Let's see how the energy changes and the molecular changes correspond. As the reactants approach, their energy increases. When the molecules are in a transition state or activated complex, their potential energy is at a maximum. As the transition state is passed and the molecules become more like products, the potential energy decreases. Finally, the molecules reach the energy state characteristic of the products. Okay, I thought there were a couple neat things in there. Lorena, does it look like for a reaction to occur, these reactants have to actually collide? No? Yeah, didn't, didn't they have to collide? If they don't collide, it ain't going to happen. So one, one thing about colliding is they got to collide in the right orientation. And that's what they can't picture here. It's really difficult. So this is where a catalyst comes in. In Gen Chem Lab, we added a catalyst, manganese dioxide, to get this potassium chlorate to decompose into oxygen gas. And that manganese dioxide didn't do anything. Well, yeah, it did. It allowed these collisions to occur at the right orientation. And so what it ended up doing is, because without that, this little guy, this energy of activation right here, it really lowers it. It really lowers that hump. That's what a catalyst does. It really lowers that hump. So that doesn't take much energy at all to go from reactants to products. So, but that's kind of a little more information than you need. But, okay. Well, maybe not. It might be in the homework. So in the plots to the right, which describes an endothermic reaction, Dylan, and which describes an exothermic? We've got a blue and a green one. Which is which? Exothermic's blue. He's, why is he right? Not absorb energy. It gives it off, right? Because remember, exo was supposed to be giving off heat. Exo it heats a product. So, right, you're starting out at really high energy. You're starting out really high energy, end up really low. Oh, yeah, definitely. The blue one. You end, up with a real, you end up with products that are really low energy, so all that missing energy is heat. It's given off as heat. So then the endothermic one must be the green one. Okay. Are most reactions in nature endothermic or exothermic? Steven, this is just a guess. I don't know if you know, but you got a 50-50 shot at it. Oh, don't buy a lottery ticket today. It's exothermic. It's exothermic. Most, most reactions in nature are exothermic. And that's more advanced chemistry to really to know why. OK. What is EA? What does EA stand for? Who is this? Sarah, what does EA stand for? Right? We see it on these plots. 
That lady mentioned it, but you don't have to have a really caught it. Does anyone catch that, what she said? Energy of activation. Energy of activation is what they call EA. And what is it? Well, it's just the hump that you have to go, go over to get to products, right? Because you're starting out at reactants, and here's the hump, that height and energy. That's what you have to overcome to get products. If you're on the green plot, to get to products, you have to overcome this hump, a lot bigger hump. So it's EA is a lot bigger. Okay, so that EA is what's lowered by a catalyst, that energy of activation. So that's what EA is. How about Tanya reaction coordinate? Because right? so we've got energy, energy here, and then they have another title on the x-axis called reaction coordinate. What do you think that means? Well, it could be a certain point on the reaction coordinate is where, yeah, that's where the reaction is occurring, right? So it's pretty much just how far apart those molecules are, right? It's kind of the position of everything, right? Where's everything at? What's the progression of the reaction? Is it at the beginning or is it at the end? Is this kind of a fancy, ambiguous name for, you know, the progression of the reaction? How's it going? Where's it at? Where is everything? Are you at the beginning or the end, the middle? OK. How about this? Here's my enthalpy. Enthalpy. And the Rxn just means reaction. So the enthalpy of my reaction. And it's not drawn on here. Right? If I clean this up, enthalpy of reaction isn't on here. Right? Because if you wanted to sketch EA, no big deal. You can identify it, just like they did. But where would you sketch energy of activation? Paul, what would you say from where to where is going to be energy, sorry, enthalpy of reaction? From where to where on this plot could I say enthalpy of reaction? It's a tough question. You have to draw the arrow, just like you did energy of activation, it's just the hump that you have to get over from reactants to products, but not enthalpy. Does anybody know? Enthalpy is just the difference between reactants and products. So wherever the reactant energy is and wherever the product energy is, that's your enthalpy. And you can put a little Rx then on the bottom if you want, but the enthalpy, that's, just the, that's always the enthalpy, the difference between the reactants and the products. So is it the same for both? It's the same height, but they're just going to be differing in sign. So it's going to be the same number of joules. It's just going to be differing in sign. Okay. For example, do you remember this? Exothermic delta H is less than zero or greater than zero? All of them. It's exothermic. It's giving off heat. It's, they want it to be negative. Delta H is always less than zero for exothermic. So they want the heat to be negative, this negative energy, negative joules. It just means that you're losing this energy. If it's endothermic, they want positive joules. So delta H would be bigger than zero. Positive joules. You're sucking up that energy. You're gaining energy. Okay. Thermite reactions. Take a look at this one. Aluminum metal is a very strong reducing agent. The flower pot contains thermite, a mixture of finely ground aluminum metal and iron free oxide plus a starter mixture containing magnesium metal. The reaction is initiated by igniting the magnesium metal ribbon.
drum of the molten iron has flowed out through the bottom of the flower pot into the bucket of sand. I think we might have seen that before. Some looks familiar. So identify the energy of activation and the enthalpy of the reaction on the below plot. So this is that thermite reaction. So we're drawing your arrows for how you would identify the energy of activation and the enthalpy. Drawing your arrows. Identify them on that plot. Okay, so before we go to the boards and try to work out some problems together, let's just wrap this one up. Kendall, how, how did you draw your energy of activation? I did like the top of the cup. Okay. Down to like where it says react. Exactly, very good. That would be your energy of activation, the hump you got to get over. Then how about your enthalpy? Here, you can get, toss that back to Kendall. Audrey, how'd you do... Uh, Delta H. Um, the same thing, but on the bottom down. Like, Starting where? Where is it? Uh, reactants. Okay, reactants. Down. down to? Um, the other reactant. The products. Products. Yeah, don't go all the way down to reaction coordinate. Go down to here. Delta H. Okay, pass that back to her. Will delta H be positive or negative in this? Sydney, what would you say? Would delta H be positive or negative? We don't know how many kilojoules this is going to be, or joules, but would it be a positive or a negative number? Where'd she go? Sydney, what'd you say? Mm, not positive, right? Because it's exothermic. You end up at a lower energy, so it's giving off a lot of heat. It has to be negative, right? This would be a negative delta H, OK? Okay, so let's go to the boards and work these out together. We'll work with the folks around you at the board and see if you can agree with an answer for some of these, and then we'll go over them. So this is more like conceptual stuff. You might need a calculator later, but sooner or later you will need a calculator, I think. You just erase it. Everybody knows. I can't speak okay. for her. I would go ask her. Ask her? Yeah, okay. she'll be in here right Pause. after this. So she comes right in here right after this. We're yeah. class. I'll just ask her to the question. Yeah. So write down your answer for A. Is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? And why? Write down your answer for A. Is it endothermic or exothermic? And why? Man, has it changed again from what's in here? Yeah. Oh, it is changed. Ah, man, I don't know how they got so modified. Good. Exothermic, because it's a negative number. Very good. Go on to the next one. For the thermochemical equation above, are reactants or products at lower energy? Write down your answer so everyone see if everyone agrees. Be confident. Are reactants or products at lower energy? It was exothermic. Think of that plot. Lorena, what would it be? It's giving off all this heat. So products have to be at a lower energy, right? Oh, I see. I can hardly see. Okay, good. Okay. Products got to be at a lower energy. 
Okay, now we're getting into some math. Does everybody agree that products that are at a lower energy? Now we're getting into some math problems. If two moles of aluminum react, what is the change in delta H? We just have to get used to their English here. They want answers in kilojoules here, because delta H is just another word for heat. So if two moles of aluminum react, how much heat do you get? But we're not supposed to say that. We're supposed to say, if two moles of aluminum react, what is the change in enthalpy? So start with two moles of aluminum. If you're not sure how to do this, Ah, oh, we're used to the mole bridge idea, right? We're used to saying like four moles of aluminum for every three moles of oxygen. I think we're really comfortable with that, right? All we're going to add is one more mole bridge. Four moles of aluminum for, there it is, negative 300 kilojoules. That's a mole bridge. But I didn't write it right because my moles of aluminum won't cancel. Right? So I'll have to flip that mole bridge ratio. So start with two moles of aluminum. Use the right mole bridge ratio. So moles of aluminum cancel. You end up in kilojoules, and you're done. Right? You see that? So you pretty much just be flipping this one. Right? Yeah, and then you get your answer. Well, no, no. You're just going to start with two moles of aluminum. Oh. Start with two moles of aluminum. All right? And then you pick the right mole bridge. There's four moles of aluminum for every negative 300 kilojoules. So what? You get about negative 150? So you should get about negative 150 kilojoules for, for that one. Okay. Okay. You should about negative 150. So now that you kind of have the idea here, see if you can do D, E, and F. Because it's just a mole bridge idea, except it's going to get more and more complicated as it goes on. So then you have one mole of aluminum oxide. What's the change in enthalpy? So if you're not sure what's going on, just ask. So if you or the folks around you don't see what to do, yeah, do them all. Do D, E, and it. Do, oh, do them all. So what's this Q thing? The Q is just another symbol for delta H. It's just another way that the book wants you to think of as heat. And in physics, they use the symbol Q a lot for heat. So we're trying to stick with that. We also have some equations like Q equals C delta T and C Q equals MS delta T. But Q is always represents heat. So that's all you really got to think of. So use the mole bridge and get your answer, because Q has to be in kilojoules. And then if heat is released or absorbed, that depends on the sign that, of the answer that you get. Yeah. So is heat going to be absorbed or given off? It's negative. No, negative means exothermic. Oh. Negative is exothermic. Well, no, yeah, go, 
Yeah. It'll go by your answer. So okay. it all depends on is that sign. Yeah, so yeah, it's getting. So it's given off. Okay, so did you get, the, get an answer for E? What did you get as an answer for E? Giselle, did you get an answer for E? Um, no, not yet. yet? What did you get? Negative 150? Negative 100? You might want to work this one out. One mole of O2. And where is it? Three, o, three oxygens for every negative 300 kilojoules. Yeah, so you should be getting negative 100. OK, but the ant, that's part of it. But they want to know released or absorbed. So what word do I write? Released, because it is negative or exothermic. All right? Negative 100 kilojoules will be released. No, do you don't, no, this is the answer. That's the answer. Try F. Start with three grams of aluminum, go all the way to kilojoules, because that's what the Q is. Q is heat. Heat is enthalpy. Enthalpy is kilojoules. Yeah, the, yeah, write AL up here. Yep, and then moles of aluminum and kilojoules up there. But yeah, you got your podcast. You, just, you can just work on the homework. All right? Make use of this darn thing. Does so anybody get an answer for F? Negative 8.34? So somewhere around negative 8, it sounds like, right? OK, depends on your rounding. You're OK with that? All right. Once you figure out the trick to this, you're going to like these problems. Just have to figure out what the trick is. OK. See if you can figure it out. Let's try A. They give you the answer for the top reaction. They did something to that reaction. And they want to know what the new delta H will be. See if you can identify what they did to that reaction in comparison to the first, the top one, and then see if you can figure out what the new delta H will be for that reaction. It's just what, Connor? So the answer would be? Positive 300. Do you see why? Connor, why? Because all they did is what? They flipped it. They flipped the reaction. So it's like saying, hey, you're not exothermic anymore. You're endothermic. Do you see that? So if you flip a reaction, you just got to change the sign. Try B. You're right. You'll be divided by half. Does anybody have a guess for B? Negative 600? Yeah, just multiply everything through by 2. Right? Kendall, do you see that? All they did is they multiplied this whole thing through by 2. That means you better multiply this by 2 also. 
Negative 600 kilojoules. Write your answers down for C and D and see if we can all agree on it. How about C? Negative 150. Negative 150, perfect. How about uh, D? I hear positive 1,200. Yeah, they flipped it, so it's got to be positive. Then they multiplied through by 4. OK. Let's try this one. Number 3. They want you to write a thermochemical equation. All that means is identify the reactants, identify the products, and write a delta H. That's what a thermochemical equation is. It's a reaction with a delta H. See if you can identify what that reaction is. Make sure you balance it. And then write down uh, delta H. And that is a thermochemical equation. Anybody want to give it a shot? It's worth a Hershey. Lorena, what do you want to say it is? Fe plus 2 HCl H2 FeCl2. It's good so far. Final answer? Oh! She's so close. It's negative 87.9. She was so close. Well, Lorena, does all your work for you, Kenneth. OK. Actually, you should have a little more on here. These thermochemical equations are really big on subscripts. So it said iron metal, so you should have a solid. And it had, uh, what was HCl? Hydrochloric acid, so I guess you write aqueous or something, right? And then that's a gas. And iron, aqueous iron 2 chloride, so that's aqueous. OK. OK. Try four. Given the below thermochemical equation, what is delta H for the reaction involving one mole of tetraphosphorus decoxide? Write the thermochemical equation.
All right. Anybody have an answer? Negative 452 for, well, they want the whole thermochemical equation, though. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna want this to be a one. You're right. You're gonna want this to be a one. You're getting there. Six H two O. Six H two O's. There it is. So all Steph did is multiply through by what? Four. She just multiplied through by four. Multiply through by four. Okay, try EX5. This one's a big culmination of really what we're doing. See if you remember what we were talked about like 20 minutes ago. The average speed of a chlorine dioxide molecule at 25 degrees Celsius is 360 meters per second. What's the kinetic energy in joules of a chlorine dioxide molecule moving at this speed? And I give you the equation. Would have been really fun if it would have gave you the speed in miles per hour. You have grams. So you remember that really the only thing you got to do is find that mass of a single molecule, right? I remember that was molecular weight all over Avogadro. But it had to be in kilograms, though. That was a trick to doing it, to get the mass of a single molecule of anything. Divide the molar mass by Avogadro's number. But then you got to get it in kilograms, otherwise you're not going to have joules. Positive 25? Yeah, that makes that looks better. Okay.
Anybody get an answer? What'd you get, Emily? She said 7.26 and 10 and 8 of 21. It's not what I got. 7.26. Really? That's what you guys got? Did you get that, Connor? All right, that's got to be right then. You guys can have one. All righty. So, I think you got the idea, right? So, have a good day.